Um, we have another exciting session to continue with the, um, uh, uh, with the, with the Congress. We have three um, engaging speakers. And at this point, I'd like to ask all three of them to come and stay on the stage during the whole session. Um, this was um, per the request of, of the organizers. And as the moderator, I'm you know, slamming my fist down and saying we must all stay up here all the time. That includes me, too. And so, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take some of that as well. And so to get started, um, I would like to introduce Mark David. He's a professor in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Illinois. He's been here since 1985. He earned his P bachelor's from Penn State University, his master's from the University of Maine, and his PhD from State University of New York um, in the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Um, he studies nitrogen and phosphorus biogeochemistry in agricultural fields, losses to streams and rivers, and uh, phosphorus biogeochem um, and um, methods to reduce these losses, such as fertilizer application, timing, cover crops, drainage, water management, so on and so forth. His research seeks to better understand the mechanisms of nutrient loss and the effectiveness of nutrient reduction methods. He has quite a few prestigious honors, including um, being a fellow of the Soil Science Society of America and the American Society of Agronomy and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This morning, Professor David will present on bio biofuel and agricultural production, impacts on water quality, and strategies to reduce them. So please help me welcome him. Well, thanks, Carl. Uh, we're going to be a little different topic than the first session. I'm going to talk. Uh, about water quality instead of water volumes. Uh, generally in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, we generally have too much water a lot of the time and a lot of the systems that we've developed are to get rid of water. Unfortunately, they also take nutrients with them. And so I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna focus a little bit about Illinois just because there's a lot going on right now. Uh, so when we talk about water quality problems, there's really two, two scale or two Kind of locations that we're concerned about. One is the local scale, so uh, a local river, a local uh, pond, or a lake, or a reservoir if it's Illinois. And in that case, it's often algal production, and that's also that's a phosphorus problem. So too much phosphorus, we get algal production. Same thing happening in Lake has happened in Lake Erie, and that can cause problems for for drinking water. Uh, the other is, though, a direct drinking water problem for nitrate, that if there's too much nitrate, if it's over the 10 milligram per liter EPA standard, that's, that's the other problem. So those are local issues. But then there's the downstream, the bigger downstream issue, and mostly on coastal zones, and that's hypoxia. And I'm sure most of you have heard of hypoxia. If you haven't, you, you will get a little background right now. And in terms of the Midwest, that's a problem for the Gulf of Mexico. And so that's both of those are driving uh, what's going on with nutrients, but for, again, different, somewhat different reasons. So the hypoxic zone is a, a low oxygen zone, less than two milligrams per liter. It's mapped at the end of July. If you, those people like me, I follow along, they, they provide a daily summary and a daily map when they do this every summer. It's all usually done the last week of July. This is the map uh, for this past one, where you can see from July 28th to August 3rd. And you'll see how that compares. Uh, so it's to the west of where the Mississippi uh, exits. It's uh, from along the Louisiana coast and up to about Texas. And this is the low oxygen zone. A lot of people show pictures of dead fish, and there was one shown earlier. That's not what happens. There, are, there's generally no dead fish. In fact, well, what happens is anything that can swim away swims away. And so fish really don't are not impacted. It's more things on the bottom in the benthic system that can swim away. If there was a, if infected fish, I think it would get a lot more attention. If a 10 billion dead fish rolled up on Louisiana shore every summer, we, you'd probably even hear more about it, but that doesn't happen. And so I think it, it's not necessarily the problem that some people sometimes want to make it out to be. Here's where this past summer uh, compares to the long-term average. Uh, it started being mapped in the, in the 80s, uh, and you can see it was a, a fairly large zone. Uh, we had a lot of flow from the upper Midwest and the rest of the Mississippi in May, June, which is a critical time. And you can see the, the five-year average here. Uh, and we've had this national goal of 5,000 uh, yeah, 5, square kilometers since uh, 19, uh, let me get there, 99, 2000. And uh, we're not getting, we're not exactly making progress. This isn't the kind of problem you can say is getting worse every year. It varies every year, depending on flow and the amount of nitrate that's carried down the Mississippi River. So it's highly variable. 
but you can see overall there's no real trend up or down, it's, but it, it's not that we've made a whole lot of progress. And we've had a newer plan since 2008 to control it. It's all voluntary and it really hasn't, hasn't done very much. And in fact, uh, it had a target date of this year for me meeting the new, uh, for reaching that 5,000 square kilometer uh, goal. And to do that, the estimate is we'd need a 45% reduction in the amount of total phosphorus and nitrate that goes down the, the Mississippi and reaches the Gulf. However, it's 2015, we hadn't made any progress, and so surprisingly, I thought, US EPA uh, changed it. And on February 12th, this didn't get a lot of air time, I thought, but they changed it. They said, well, we haven't, we haven't done it yet, let's give ourselves another 20 years. Which is kind of interesting for an environment, if, if it's that critical of an environmental problem that we've known about for, and had a goal for 15 years, we just gave ourselves another 20, so maybe we can tackle it in 35 years. I think it also demonstrates the, the difficulties of reducing nutrients on that scale. Uh, to sort of give an intermediate goal, they also, and spur action, as they said, they called for a 20% reduction in those nutrients by 2025. So that's where we're at right now. We have a goal of, of 20 years from now. Uh, we haven't made much progress. And it, it, it's, it, the scale of this is something that that's the problem. So, Here's the long-term pattern of nutrients going down the Mississippi. The top one is water, just to show that water has increased from the 50s a little bit, but if anything, it's maybe trending downward. But the real key to hypoxia is nitrate. And it went from this low, uh, you know, maybe uh, 0.5 uh, million metric tons, and it's, it's been pretty flat uh, for 30 years now. That's really what drives the hypoxic zone and where the, new, the reduction would have to be in agriculture. Uh, other forms of N have gotten better because of sewage treatment, but again, nitrate has been the one we haven't been able to tackle. Um, here's phosphorus, same water pattern, and phosphorus actually has been going up, and we're not really sure why that is. Uh, but that's, that's a bigger problem, same problem in Lake Erie, where phosphorus has gone back up and, and causing problems. So those are the two nutrients that would have to be reduced by 45%. Uh, again, if some work we did uh, a few years ago, I mean, the, where, does, where do these nutrients come from? Where we have the most intensive agriculture. Uh, if you look here, you see where fertilizer is mostly used, uh, or the most intensive use of fertilizer. It's also where we have the most intensive crop production, corn and soybeans. And it's also where we have the most tile drainage. Again, for those of you not from here, this, this landscape is very flat and would not be farmable and wasn't. Uh, uh, before we figured out how to ditch and deepen the, the river channels and add tile drainage. And Praveen used, uh, I haven't got to that slide yet, but it would be looking like this up in the corner in, well into the summer if it wasn't for, tile, for artificial drainage. And so tiles have been long put in, uh, the rivers have been channelized. We now use plastic tile, but we used to use clay tile. The estimate is in Illinois, uh, 10 million acres or maybe six, uh, five, or four or five million hectares of land are tile drained. And that's true again across the upper Midwest. Wherever you have really productive corn and soybeans, it's, it's, it's tile drained. And these can be put in now. They used to be random tiles. Now they're put in in patterned. Uh, more and more tile going e each year. We don't know how much because there's no record kept of that. And again, this, this was a slide that Praveen had, that this is a ditch just to the south of here. And part of the problem is uh, nitrate is a very mobile form of N as a, a water quality problem. And when water's moving through the soil and there's nitrate in the soil, it goes out the tile water. And that's one of our fundamental problems. The other problem we have is surface runoff, though. And as we have climate change and we have more intensive rainstorms, which we've seen over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, we get, and we, we have tilled fields in the spring, we have tremendous amounts of sediment that are lost, and sediment carries phosphorus with it. So tiles are mainly a nitrate problem, surface runoff doesn't carry much nitrate, but at the end it carries sediment and it also carries total P. So both of those then become, uh, generate the water quality problems. So what are we doing about it? Well, all the states uh, along the main stem of the Mississippi River were mandated to come up with nutrient reduction strategies. Uh, Illinois, I Greg McIsaac, who's here, and I were uh, 
part of the team that did the science assessment for Illinois, that is the, sort of the guts of this strategy. Ours was just released on July 21st, the final version of it. Uh, we added a word to it uh, and to make it uh, more acceptable because a lot of people thought nutrient reduction meant nutrients on the input side, but it's not that, it's, it's on the output side. So we're the first state to call it a nutrient loss reduction strategy. Uh, we did it in an unusual way. A lot of states that have done it have either been state agencies or just the, um, uh, it's done in ver behind closed doors. Uh, I have to say I was skeptical when we started it, but we did it with everybody in the room for two years. So that meant the agricultural groups, the environmental groups, the point source groups, because in Illinois we do have a big population, large population, so point sources are quite important. Uh, we did the science assessment. And it basically lays out a voluntary strategy to reduce nitrate in total P. So one of the things we figured out, where, where do they come from in Illinois? Well, nitrate is primarily a agricultural issue. I mean, it's 80, about 80% and about maybe 18 from point sources. But phosphorus is half and half. I mean, we have a big population in Chicago. There's a big sewage treatment plant, so we have a large amount of phosphorus. So uh, I think the point source group is really focused on phosphorus as a result of this, and agriculture is really focused on nitrate. And this is the same kind of, uh, here's water uh, going back to 1980 through 2011, and of course the amount of water in all the rivers, if you add them up in Illinois, is highly variable each year, and so are the nutrients. Uh, these are in pounds because that's what we had to do for this kind of assessment, but Illinois loses a large amount of both nitrate and total P. And one way to put that in perspective is to look at what percentage we are of the total amount going down the Mississippi. And we're a big part. Remember, the Mississippi's, what, 40% of the United States? We're 20% of the nitrate on average and 11% of the phosphorus. So what, what happens here in Illinois and in, in Iowa is the other big state really matters for reducing these nutrients more than, than uh, many of the other states. And you can see even some years we're as high as 30% of, again, all the nitrate that's reaching the Gulf of Mexico. And for us, those targets would be a 45% reduction. It's, it's pretty substantial. You can see that we've almost, even in drought years, we've, we've never really made it for phosphorus and barely made it for nitrate. So the, the task for a state like Illinois, heavily agricultural, big, uh, large population, is substantial. So when we, still, we focused on agriculture and what can we do in agriculture and there, the way all these kind of practices have been grouped are in, in three kinds of ways. One are what are called now the four R's. These are new, trying to use nutrients in the field more efficiently. And so that's the right form or right source, rate, time and place of the nutrients. But then there's a whole range of infield management, things like less tillage, so you have less sediment loss, cover crops perennials, biofuels that I'll talk about in a little bit, and land retirement. And then there's, so that's actually changing what you're actually doing in the field. And then the other, the last set is, well, just keep doing what you're doing, we'll take care of it at the edge, you know, so you don't have to change your farming system. And that's things like buffers, um, wood chip bioreactors, constructed wetlands, drainage water management, there's something called saturated buffers, and even modifying the stream channel so that you have uh, better denitrification in, in the channel. So there's a lot of different practices. And so one of the things, um, these are just some pictures, kind of cover crops can be very effective, but the further north you are, the more challenging they are. And this was a year where we had really a good cover crop uh, around here. Other years have not been so good. Um, they're, they're somewhat variable. Uh, constructed wetlands we work on, they can be very effective, but they don't get much social acceptance. People just don't like them. Uh, bioreactors uh, are basically beds of wood chips that you send the tile drainage through to really speed up denitrification because you're putting it through all that carbon. Uh, they, they're co they cost a fair amount and, and they don't do anything for productivity or anything, but they're somewhat acceptable because when you're done, you, there's not a whole lot you see on the edge of the field. So uh, this is kind of a little complicated fit table, but just to give you a sense, what one of the things we did is say, well, if you took any of these practices, in this case, I'm just going to show you nitrate, and applied it as much as we think you could apply in, in Illinois, how much of a difference would it make? I mean, would any one of these just you know, have nitrate loss, or 75%, or are they all 5%? 
And so these, this first set is infield practices and reducing rates, changing when we put fertilizer on. Uh, what you see is the column that you can really look at here is the nitrate reduction from the baseline. And most of these are pretty small, except for one, and that's putting cover crops on all corn and soybean tile-drained acres. So if every acre, which is, again, 10 million acres of tile-drained corn and soybean got cover crops, that might be a 20% reduction. That's, that's a, you know, we have 100,000 acres of cover crops right now, so that's a tall order. Uh, they're less effective on non-tile-drained acres because those acres don't lose much nitrate. Uh, but again, you, you get the idea, and then we could calculate a dollar per pound of N removed and compare some of these practices. But you also see the percent reduction per acre. None of these are, are going to reduce it 50% uh, or 100% in this category. Uh, they're mostly, what, the, the best one is 30%. So that's the challenge right there. Again, keep in mind, we're trying to get to 45%. If we look at edge of field practices, um, Two of the big ones are the bioreactors and wetlands, and, and they can do a pretty good job. Um, there's this buffer one. Don't be misled. That's 90% of the water that actually goes through a buffer. In Illinois, most of the water doesn't go through the buffer. It goes through the tile line. So that, that one, uh, that, that's really there for phosphorus, but that 90% is a little misleading. One of the things is, well, what if we did go to perennials or biofuels? Well, uh, and in work we've done with Evan, uh, yeah, we, this is conservative, it probably should be 99% reduction for some of the biofuels. Those are really effective, but there's not much chance that we're going to, at any time soon, we're going to convert large acres to those biofuels. If we did, they, they'd actually be very effective, and, uh, you know, the, uh, but the cost per pound can, can be high, and there's, there's really not the market for those. So th we left that in there as an example, and then the last one is point sources. Nitrate, again, isn't very important for point sources. So this kind of lays out, just to give you an example, that there, for the most part, there is no one practice. And so what we end up with is this long list of things that we might consider. And what I, what, what, where we are right now is out there trying to sell this. Uh, the agricultural community has really embraced this, given they've had what they call the roadshow on the nutrient strategy when it was released. Uh, they've really been trying to get across to farmers that everybody has to do something on every acre. Uh, but what about biofuels? Uh, per perennials really work in reducing nutrient losses, both surface runoff and tile drainage. And things like miscanthus, switchgrass, prairie, uh, you know, we don't harvest much N and P. They don't have high requirements, so they, they don't need many inputs. Uh, they can work really well. Uh, one of the figures, I know Evan likes this figure, uh, that we had, this, this is on the, the biofuel plots here over a, a seven year period where we took a field that had been in uh, production and put individual tile systems. So it has corn, corn, soybean, miscanthus, switchgrass, and prairie. And initially they all had a really high nitrate concentration, typical of tile drainage around here, anywhere from 10 to 30 milligrams per liter. And the black is the corn. You can see that we had corn, corn, soybean. It got a little lower, but then we fertilized the corn again, and the corn's back up, corn and soybeans back up in the 20 to 25. Of course, we had the drought in there too that made it worse. But that's a typical pattern, varying around, moving around, but typical for corn and soybean production. But what you see for the biofuels is a, a general reduction through just a few years. Tile drainage speeds up the how fast things uh, occur, and uh, the miscanthus had to be replanted, so that lagged behind a little bit. But you can see by the fourth year and through now, the concentrations are even lower than I ever thought they would be. They're less than a half a milligram per liter. And the, the switchgrass is fertilized. The miscanthus has just started to be fertilized. But they lose hardly any nutrients. So the good side of, of biofuels and perennials is they're really efficient, even on tile drains they can really reduce things. The, the bad part of them is they're hard. To, that's not something that most farmers want to do. So we have the sort of social acceptance, the economic system to support those. But what this shows is a lot of times people bring up that, well, with our really rich soils here in Illinois and high productivity, no matter what you did, you would lose nutrients. No, that's not really true. If you have a perennial that has a root system that's active early in the spring and late into the fall, 
new, those, th those uh, perennials can really do a very good job of sucking up all the nutrients and leaving very little that's lost. So we know that's true, but that's, but that's not what we have. And so where we are is left with all those other practices to try and implement things. So the bottom line for, for when we look across, and Illinois' case is typical of the other states in the upper Midwest, and when, I mean southern Minnesota, Iowa, Indiana, and Ohio. That's, that's the tile drain corn belt where these nutrients come from. 45% reductions are going to be really, really difficult. And again, I think the extension for 20 years of the, of the target is, is a reflection of that. And we, we haven't really started. A lot of times you may hear and you can see all these press releases from different projects, but on a really big scale to make massive changes in nutrients, we, we, haven't, we haven't really done anything. I mean, if you drive around here this winter, look how many acres you see that are green. And you won't see many. And I've, I've had this bet with other people about if you drive from here to Chicago or somewhere, how many, uh, how many cover crop acres you see versus acres of new tile. And for me, new tiles won the last three years, every time. Uh, that's where the emphasis is. People, you know, people really want to get rid of water. And that is the key thing to increasing productivity, unfortunately. So there are a variety of methods. There is no one method that's going to get us there. Uh, one of the problems is many of these methods are not related to yield. In other words, they don't improve yield. So that means we're going to have to pay the farmer to do it. They're not going to do it voluntarily to put in a bioreactor unless somebody else is paying for it. And our estimate was uh, about a billion dollars a year to do for 20 years to get to that 45% reduction. And Iowa came up with a similar number. So $20 billion. Uh, that, that some of that was for point sources, but the bulk of it was agriculture. And again, the scale of this problem is impressive. We want better yields. We want to improve uh, that, the, what we're harvesting, but we want to limit losses. And that's, that's, both of those are, are very hard to get. And I think that biofuels, unless things change, are likely to have a pretty small role, especially on the best soils, which are the tile-drained ones. So that's it, hopefully. So at the end of the session, we'll have a half an hour um, question and answer uh, session. And so we would like to refrain from questions until then. All right, our next speaker is Professor Jim Shortle, is a distinguished professor of agriculture and environmental economics and director of the Environment and Natural Resources Institute in the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State University. Um, his work focuses on economic and policy issues in the management of water pollution and other environmental externalities from agriculture and the impacts of climate change on agriculture and water. His research has been supported by multiple state, federal, and international, as well as nonprofit organizations. Um, and he serves on, uh, has served on the advisory committee to the EPA Science um, Advisory Board and on the recent National Resource Council uh, Committee on Science for the EPA's Future. Today, Professor Shortle will present on water quality in agriculture, policies to harmonize food production with pr protection of aquatic ecosystems and ecosystem services. So please join me again in welcoming Professor Shortle. Well, thank you for, to the organizers for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, and uh, we're going to be shifting watersheds here from the Midwest to the Chesapeake Bay. And there are some interesting differences between those and I didn't appreciate those until now, so that will be interesting. Um, on my uh, title slide here, I also have the Center for Nutrient Pollution Solutions, which is the shorter name for an EPA funded center that I have that looking at that topic. Um, so, um, Mark talked about sort of the physical aspects of solving the nutrient problem. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I think mostly informed by my watershed, uh, but I'm really interested more in the policy of how do we get these farmers to do this stuff we need them to do in order to do what we need to have done. And um, I'm not going to say we need to pay them, uh, because I've decided that's not the solution. <laughs> um, so just um, 
Uh, agriculture, probably many of you know this, is the leading cause of water quality problems in the U.S. and there's lots of documentation of that. And the number one one we worry about, but not the only one we worry about, is nutrient pollution. And the problem is bigger than just the U.S. We have nutrient problems in a lot of places because of ag, and I'll show you a map of that in just a second. So I put in, in this slide ecological scarcity. So yesterday we heard a great talk on volumetric scarcity, and part of that is actually environmental flows that support ecosystems and in-stream services. But um, agriculture has a huge impact on ecosystems. And Mark was saying, well, you know, if we were killing a lot of fish, we'd worry about this. Uh, we don't kill a lot of fish with nutrient systems and nutrient pollution, and we don't actually poison people very much. So health issues aren't big, but the ecological issues are big and are of a lot of concern to people. And if you told anybody, excuse me, anybody who is associated with the Chesapeake Bay that the degradation of the ecosystems there isn't a big issue, you might risk being killed. So i never say that. <laughs> oh, and he didn't mean that anyway, so. <laughs> Um, so this is just a map that came out in a science article a few years ago about world hypoxic and eutrophic coastal areas. So um, uh, hypoxic means you have low dissolved oxygen and eutrophic means that you have a lot of productivity related to nutrient systems. And if you look at the eastern U.S., you'll see our coast is pretty much filled with dots where nutrients are coming from from inland areas and then going to coastal areas and causing these problems. You have a lot of those elsewhere. Another big area is up there in Northern Europe where we ha they have problems very similar to ours, where we're sending a lot of nutrients downstream, a lot from agriculture, and they're causing problems in coastal waters. Um, if you look in the U.S., so in the U.S., under the Clean Water Act, if a stream doesn't meet water quality standards that are set by a state, then those waters are designated as impaired. And this is from state assessments of, of their impaired waters. And when you look at the number one cause of, of impairments, it's, it's pathogens, but the number two cause is nutrients. Um, so important. If you look at the causes or sort of the problems with impaired waters, I have types of waters in the, in the rows and sort of what's impaired and the columns. And you'll see a lot of the impairments that we have are more aquatic than things that are directly related to humans. So public water supply, generally low percent of the impairments, damages to fish, shellfish, wildlife, aquatic life, things of that nature are where we get a lot of these impairments. So the nutrient problems and the ones caused by ag are mainly risks to ecosystems, productivity of fisheries, things of that nature. Uh, just looking at the top five sources of our water quality problems, ag ranks pretty important. It's in the top three of, of several of those. So um, it is a significant issue. So if you're looking at why somebody might in, from Pennsylvania might be especially interested in water quality problems, well, you see that Pennsylvania has the, by far, the, number, the highest number of stream miles impaired in the U.S. Um, some of that, a good portion of that, maybe half of that is from acid mine drainage. Most of the rest of that is by ag impairments. So big issues there. Um, so reducing ag's impacts. So uh, yes, we need to reduce nutrient pollution loads from ag. Uh, another thing we need to do is we need to protect and restore wetland stream banks and riparian zones. At least in Pennsylvania, uh, a lot of what we get well, very little of our nutrients flow through tile drains. Uh, we get some uh, significant surface flow off of fields, but we also get a lot of, of nutrients that come from stream bank erosion, things that are already in the stream that are moving downstream. And they came from ag long ago, uh, but they're moving down. But the number one thing, so, so Mark talked about technological strategies for addressing this problem. They're all very important to us. Um, I think for me, the number one issue in addressing these problems is policy. Uh, so if we're going to get the things done that we need to do to get what we need to have done done, we have to have public policies that do it. And so I think for me, the nutrient problem is not first and foremost a technology problem, although there are significant technological dimensions 
To me, it's first and foremost a public policy problem. So I think we really have to think about getting the policies right. So current approaches, and this is an oversimplification, uh, for confined animal feeding operations, which are big, intensive, uh, like dairy farms and feedlots and things of that nature, uh, under the Clean Water Act, they're regulated as point sources of pollution and required to have permits that meet technological standards that are imposed by EPA um, or state environmental agencies. But once you move out of those big, intensive type operations, agriculture generally is not much regulated for its water quality impacts. Um, so farmers aren't probably told limits on what can come down a tile drain. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, there's, you know, we have some um, certain kind of planning requirements at farms, but very little of, of it is actually enforceable. So our current strategies are really, first of all, moral suasion, telling farmers they're having an impact and then asking them to do something about it. And then we provide type financial and technical assistance to help them adopt BMPs. So the practices that Mark was talking about are often cost shared by NRCS to help farmers adopt them from a financial standpoint. They'll give them technical sense, uh, assistance. And the strategy then is to get lots of those on the ground so we can solve this problem. But, and we've been doing that for a very, very long time. So I've been in this business for 30 years. We've been doing the same things for 30 years and we're still worried about the very same problems. Um, so NRCS recently had something called the Conservation Effectiveness Assessment Program that looked at the effectiveness of NRCS programs across the country. And uh, in most places, they find conservation programs help, but they don't solve the problem. And we have to go a long way if we're going to address the nutrient problems that we have. So the question is more of the same, more financial assistance, uh, of moral, moral suasion, or do we do something new? And I think we need to do something new. Um, so the limitations of our current approach, first of all, it's all voluntary compliance, uh, except for the CAFOs, generally, nobody has to do anything. There are exceptions. Maryland, for example, is becoming very aggressive in regulating ag nutrient problems. But on the whole, who adopts BMPs is determined basically by their own choices. If you want to have some, you can do it all by yourself or you can get NRCS to help you if the funds are available. So this results in something that I'm calling now anything, anywhere, and perhaps nothing at all. This came out of a recent conversation I had with the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, um, which is under huge stress because, so just a little aside, uh, this presentation is actually an edited version of something I did for Pennsylvania's Department of Environment, Environmental Protection recently. Um, so in 1983, the states in Chesapeake Bay watershed decided they had to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, and they set a 40% goal in 1983 for reducing nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and they, they continued to revisit this goal, they upped the goal, and they didn't make progress. So we had a long time, nearly 30 years, over 30 years, and in 2010, the EPA said, well, uh, now you actually have to do something, and we get, got what is called a total maximum daily load, which is a Clean Water Act provision that when an impaired water doesn't meet its standards, you can then actually do something about non-point sources, at least in principle. And so the EPA really put stringent requirements on nutrient reductions for the Chesapeake Bay. So for Pennsylvania, we're looking at a 23% uh, reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus over sort of current levels by 2025. So um, what they used to want to do in 20 years, now they want to do in about 15. We'll see if they make it. Um, you guys got a bigger reprieve than we did. <laughs> Uh, well, what happens in Pennsylvania is, and other Bay states, is they expected the federal government to pay for the TMDL compliance and ag through extensions of existing programs, and the federal government's not doing that. The states don't have the regulatory programs that they need to, to have in order to get ag compliance. So now they have to say, wow, what do we do now to actually regulate agriculture? And 
and they're, they're bureaucrats and they're very committed to what they do, but they really don't know a lot about the problem. And so from a policy standpoint, they're really floundering and looking for new alternatives, which is why I got to go talk to them about what they might do next. Uh, but the big problem they have is that they are used to a system where you pay the polluter to reduce pollution rather than have the polluter um, do it on a polluter pays basis. And that's a big switch. And it really means you need to rethink how you do things. Um, so Mark was talking about some numbers on, on BMP costs. Uh, we have sort of the field management, edge of field management types that matter. We also have a lot of animal oriented ones because our agriculture is very animal intensive. So BMPs for us manage animals as well as, as crops. And this is just some, some numbers on the unit cost of various kinds of BMPs in the mid-Atlantic region. And you can see there's a huge variation in cost. And this is, this is important. So down there at the bottom, one of our very most popular BMPs is stream bank fencing to keep the animals out of the streams, $5,840 an acre. Very, very expensive. We have others that are way, way cheaper uh, and down close to a dollar per acre. Uh, so those are huge variations that are important. Um, and these are some of the reduction efficiencies that we have for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. We need to reduce them all in Pennsylvania to, and actually throughout the Chesapeake Bay to achieve goals. You see a lot of variation there. When you take those two numbers, what you find is huge variations in the cost effectiveness of various practices. And in fact, state agencies in the region and EPA have completely ignored these. And they have taken another approach, which is everything everywhere. Um, so I'll just show you some of the consequences of everything everywhere. So we have to develop watershed implementation plans to comply, all the states do, to comply with Chesapeake Bay TMDL. And they are based on everything everywhere. So essentially you take all of these suites of BMPs, you put them across the landscape so you don't target where they go, and you end up with very, very expensive control. I did a study for USDA to look at if you chose the most cost-effective practices and you put them in the best places, would you save money? And over there in, on the right-hand side, you'll see the cost savings from targeting things and putting them in the right places versus doing everything everywhere. And you'll see that the cost savings are really significant for some states, so Delaware, 80%, Maryland, 85%. Uh, so they can be quite substantial. So this targeting notion is one of the most important things. Um, and it takes in part these BMP efficiencies. And then another thing that's really important is putting things in the right place. Um, so um, only a, a part of most watersheds, at least, you know, I can't say for a tile drain system uh, because you plumb them. But where I live, we haven't plumbed our, our fields to run things out. So, it, so most of our runoff comes from saturated parts of, of fields, of watersheds, where uh, just the soil characteristics mean that, that those areas become saturated very quickly and you get most of your runoff there. Um, so across the Chesapeake Bay, uh, some say about 80% of the nutrients are coming from about 10% of the land. So that really means that you really, if you want to do the, address this problem cost effectively, you have to say, well, where does most of this stuff come from? We don't need to do everything everywhere. We need to do it in the right places. Um, another consideration is, so that's at a small scale, watershed scale. When you look across the bay, so this is um, a slide I, cho I stole from US B EPA's Chesapeake Bay program. And um, the left side is a little bit complicated to read, but what happens is if you put nitrogen on the ground at any place in the bay watershed, the amount that goes down to the bay varies quite a bit. So this is kind of telling you the percent of a pound that's put someplace in the bay that end up in the watershed that ends up in the bay. So red means a lot does, uh, the lighter colors mean a, that a smaller percentage does. It really tells you that even across the bay, you don't have to do everything everywhere. You really need to concentrate things in the parts of the watershed that cause the problem. Um, so some implications of this is that you can have significant cost savings by putting the right practices 
in the right places, so not everything anywhere, which is the current approach, uh, not everything everywhere, but the right things in the right places. And you would be shocked that for Pennsylvania's water quality planners, that was an entirely new and radical idea to hear that. Uh, scary. Um, so that's sort of, you know, just from a strategic standpoint, thinking about where to put your resources. But the fundamental thing we need to do is really think about what policies will result in getting the resources in the right places, in the right levels, which really means that we have to think about the right policies. So this is just a very simple description of possible policies. So I have some that are practice-based, which, uh, you know, if you're telling farmers, put, you know, manage your manure, manage your fertilizer uh, in particular places. Some are performance-based, which are, really switches the basis for evaluation from how you manage the land to what the outcomes are, and some are mixed. Uh, economists will tell you performance-based are always better because they, they keep your eye on the ball, which is the nutrient reduction that you want to have. Uh, now, because it's non-point, that's a little bit hard to, to compute, but we can do that. Then there's how you get people to do the right thing with that and we can tell them what to do, which is mandates. We can give them carrots and payments of various kinds, uh, or we can use sticks. And again, we can use various match, uh, mixes of those. And so I have various options there that are outlined. But here again is something that uh, if you find that policymakers might not always think about, is what these relative different packages do in terms of cost and water quality improvement. So some are really expensive. Um, but don't give you much performance. Others are pretty cheap and give you a lot of performance and some are really expensive and, and also give you a lot and some are really cheap and don't do much for you. So you really need to be thinking through what kinds of policies are going to give you the best outcome in terms of achieving water quality goals uh, most cost effectively. And up there in the, in the Northwest quadrant, uh, high water quality, low social cost. Uh, this is my sort of my opinion about the, what the good ones are, but they're conservation auctions, water quality trading. And I actually am, am perfectly happy with mandating some things on farms in certain places. I think about it as kind of like groundwater protection. Uh, if, a, if, if something's really harmful in a place, you shouldn't do it in that place. Um, so, um, so that is um, that sort of a view of, of small-scale management targeting things in places, the right stuff, and choosing the right policies. And I could go along uh, on about the policies for a long time, but I'm not going to because I want to talk about one other important theme, which is, so that was sort of at the watershed scale. We have problems, though, that we really have to face that are uh, much more systemic uh, and at landscape scales. So this is, from a Pennsylvania standpoint, um, a graph that I got from a colleague that shows that you are actually our problem. <laughs> so, so Illinois and other Midwestern states are really efficient at producing animal feeds, soybeans and corn. Uh, and you do a little bit of feeding animals with them but what happens is a lot of that feed actually goes to Pennsylvania, which is much more efficient at, at producing animals and delivering animal products to large markets. So we import your feed. Uh, we're not competitive with you for producing corn or soybeans, but we're way more competitive than you for producing animal products. So we import your nutrients, and we put your nutrients in our, on our fields. Um, and, um, and then the animals use only about a quarter of that in their animal products, and the other three quarters goes off in the manure, and the most efficient thing to do with the manure, and excess manure, and we have a lot of it, put it on the field, and it results in water quality problems in our region. Uh, and so what happens in Pennsylvania is you have a nutrient insensitive environment with the Chesapeake Bay estuary, that is importing a lot of nutrients from you all and leaving a lot of them there. Uh, so this is really a landscape scale view of this nutrient problem, which means you really have to think about the agricultural system 
in addition to thinking about what you do in individual watersheds. Um, so this is another view of the mass imbalances, moving that stuff from where you are to where we are. Our phosphorus balances in particular have been going up. Um, but we get more, more from you than just the stuff that comes in feed. We get it in atmospheric deposition. So uh, power plant emissions out here lead to nitrogen deposition over there. Um, so that's not an ag problem. Thinking about this systemic thing, in addition, you can see that you know, in, in recent years, the amount of nitrogen that we have in the environment, reactive nitrogen, much of it related to ag and other sources, is skyrocketing. So, um, so we can think about these problems at small scales, and we do for cost-effective solutions. And, but what we really need to also do is think about strategies to address these landscape things. And so this actually leads me to uh, an issue that was discussed at the session last night, and that's getting prices right. Uh, so if we're only addressing the watershed problems, we can address them in various ways. But if we really want to address the landscape scale problems, we need to get the prices right. We need to get farmers facing the cost of the externalities that they cause across the country, because that's the only way you're going to get a distribution of agricultural activity um, across the country, which um, balances the ecological concerns with the economic productivity of agriculture. I have a number of articles which talk about how to get the prices right. Time doesn't permit me to talk, so I'll quit. Okay, for our final presentation of the morning session, um, Professor Ashlyn Stillwell is an assistant professor in civil engineering, uh, civil and environmental engineering here at the University of Illinois. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Missouri and has a master's degree, a master's of public affairs, as well as a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. She has worked as a consulting engineer as well as uh, policy-based research at the Congressional Research Service in 2009. She's also received the 2015 Girl Scouts of Central Illinois Women of Distinction in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, and has been listed among the teachers rated as excellent, um, make sure they're excellent by their students. Today, Dr. Stowell will present on multi-scale systems analysis and the energy water nexus. So please join me in welcoming you. Can everyone hear me if I stand like this? Okay, I'm told the, the podium might, might be better. Well, thank you for coming today. So we're shifting gears with this talk to talk about the other big player in the water space, which is the energy sector. And as a faculty member, we always tell our students to keep the main thing the main thing. So here's the main thing, friends. Water equals energy, energy equals water. That's the main point of all of this, but there's a lot of intricacies that we'll talk about today. So first, let's talk about one side of this energy water nexus. We use water for energy. That comes in the form of thermoelectric power plant cooling. So these photos here showing a coal-fired power plant and a natural gas-fired power plant are examples of thermoelectric facilities that then require large amounts of cooling, which is most easily accomplished using water. Hydraulic fracturing and even conventional um, collection, mining and refining of oil and natural gas requires a fair amount of water. And something that came up in the previous presentations, biofuels. Once we get that biomass, whether it's in the form of soybeans or corn or miscanthus, it is then processed into biofuels. And that also requires additional water in each step of this energy sector process. So one thing that I'll focus on in particular is thermoelectric power plants, because if we talk about water use, which is a term that I try to get all of my students to avoid relying on, power plants, thermoelectric power plants, are large water withdrawers. For if use equals withdraw, power plants withdraw a lot of water. Power plants don't actually consume as much water as they withdraw. 
If we talk about water use equaling consumption, then agriculture is the largest water consumer. That said, there's a transition to recirculating cooling in the thermoelectric power industry, which increases consumption. So if we look at a simplified view of a power plant, well, I think I'll have to use the pointer. Okay, we start with a fuel, and that fuel is burned or reacted, in the case of nuclear power, in a boiler to generate heat. So we've gone from a chemical energy source to a thermal energy source, and that heat then converts high purity water into steam. So we have a phase change that happens. The steam then goes to a steam turbine, spins the turbine such that that thermal energy is converted to mechanical energy, and the turbine is connected to a generator, and the mechanical energy then transitions to electrical energy. So we went from chemical to thermal to mechanical to electrical energy. And then we have electrons that go to the grid and a low pressure steam source that leaves the turbine. We would like to condense that low pressure steam back into water and reuse it in this closed loop here. Therefore, the power plant needs cooling. So when we talk about water withdrawal and consumption for thermoelectric power generation, we're not really talking about the steam itself, we're talking about the cooling operation. And I drew it here as a big giant heat exchanger. It could be a cooling tower, it could be a once-through facility, but the point is we withdraw large volumes of water to remove heat from thermoelectric power plants. And there's some water consumption also associated with that. If we look at US averages, just in terms of an infographic, the energy sector requires a lot of water. And at a household level, there's more water associated with the electricity use in the home than the actual direct water use inside the home. So on average, in general, US households require about 100 gallons per person per day inside the home for things like toilet flushing, drinking, bathing, etc. The indirect use of the electricity in the home is much, much larger, as you can see through this image. But power plants can actually reduce their freshwater requirements. So our conventional approach to cooling thermoelectric power plants is what's called open loop cooling, or once through cooling. And the numbers on the slide here are national averages for coal power generation. The absolute value of them is not as important as the relationship between them. So if we look at open loop cooling, we have very, very large withdrawals on a per megawatt hour of electricity generated basis, but fairly low consumption. That's kind of the old school way of doing things where we withdraw a whole bunch of water, probably some fish and other aquatic life in the process, send it through a heat exchanger and return that water at a higher temperature to the aquatic ecosystem. Newer approaches to doing that are recirculating cooling, like a cooling tower, which very much reduces water withdrawal. So if we compare those numbers, we're looking at 35,000 gallons per megawatt hour, going down to around 550 gallons per megawatt hour. That's a really big reduction, but there's a trade-off associated with that. When we recirculate water in a cooling tower, more of it is evaporated, consumed, through that recirculating action. There are other approaches beyond cooling towers. We could use a hybrid wet dry system or a completely dry system. Dry systems use fans. It's kind of like a radiator on a car, only not exactly. It's a big giant fan that uses air as the heat exchange mechanism instead of water. But we all know that water has a much higher heat capacity. We could cool something down a lot faster with water than we can with air. So there's what's called a parasitic efficiency loss with dry cooling. Different electricity fuels have very different water requirements. These numbers are for recirculating cooling. So the, the coal numbers should look familiar from the previous slide. And as we move from coal to natural gas, we actually have some water efficiency gains. So that's a good thing, right? We, we as a country are generally moving away from coal and to natural gas. 
it has fewer carbon emissions, it's cleaner than coal, and it has water efficiency gains, which is really great. Another thing that natural gas does in a combined cycle power plant is that we have two mechanisms for generating electricity in both a gas turbine and a steam turbine. So in this case, the denominator, the per megawatt hour, is much larger, and therefore the water withdrawn consumption is smaller. What's interesting is when we compare coal and nuclear power. So nuclear power, because of the lack of a combustion process, there's no heat going out the stack of a nuclear power plant, and they actually require a lot more water on a per megawatt hour basis than a similarly sized coal plant. This is important for Illinois because most of our electricity comes from coal and natural, coal and nuclear, excuse me. We have particularly thirsty electricity generation in Illinois with the highest concentration of nuclear power, and that requires a lot of water. So that top row is what we would consider in the electricity sector baseline electricity generation. These are power plants that we can turn on and off, and we as humans can control them. The bottom row is more renewables, and renewables are great, right? Solar thermal is an approach to using solar power and the heat associated with it with a steam cycle. So we, we concentrate the heat from the sun in a, a parabolic trough is usually how some of these are, are done. So I, I attempted to draw that here in PowerPoint. I can see why you might be confused in my excellent graphic capabilities. So essentially, we have a curved mirror that concentrates heat onto a working fluid. And then we have an entire steam cycle power plant at the, the other end of these curved mirrors, which still requires cooling, just like a coal plant, just like a nuclear plant. And it requires more cooling water than similarly sized coal plants. So this is a big challenge for solar thermal plants. We would typically want to locate these in places that have lots of land, because the, the mirrors take up lots of space, and lots of sun, and lots of water. And those three things rarely coincide. Usually we have lots of land and lots of sun, but not much water. So this is a big, big challenge for solar thermal. Solar thermal is different from photovoltaics. This is the traditional rooftop solar that you would think about. Photovoltaics and wind turbines don't use a steam cycle, so they don't need cooling, which is fantastic. Renewables are excellent. The challenge with wind and photovoltaics is that they're not dispatchable. We can't tell the wind to blow, we can't tell the sun to shine, so we can't really rely on wind and solar only as a baseload electricity source. It requires storage. Energy storage at the grid scale is a challenge. We are making strides in that area, but we do not yet have grid scale storage in large capacities in the United States. If we transition from the electricity part of the energy sector and look instead at liquid fuels and transportation, we see very, very different water requirements for those transportation fuels. Our conventional approach is gasoline and diesel, and these numbers are from a publication out of the University of Texas at Austin. These are in gallons per mile. And normally when we are thinking about transportation, we think about miles per gallon. This is gallons of water per mile traveled. So we're normalizing for fuel efficiency and looking at the gallons of water withdrawn and consumed for each mile traveled. And this is average, there are, there are large ranges. So gasoline and diesel are fairly water efficient. If we move instead to electric vehicles and widespread use of electric vehicles, we now depend on the water intensity of the electric grid. And because there is so much open loop cooling on the electricity grid, we have a very large water withdrawal and a fairly low water consumption per mile traveled on an electric vehicle. Natural gas can also be used as a transportation fuel directly, and it's comparable to gasoline and diesel. 
Hydrogen as a transportation fuel seemed to be the thing of the future. It was, it was 20 years out, 15 years ago, and now it's 20 years out. I, I don't really know what the future is of hydrogen, but regardless, generating hydrogen as a transportation fuel requires a lot of water because it requires a lot of electricity in that processing step. The interesting part of all of this is biofuels. So if we start to depend solely on biofuels on their own, they're comparable to gasoline and diesel. We're looking at, say, 0.5 and 0.55 gallons per mile withdrawn and similar consumption, a little bit larger for biofuels. The big change is once we get into irrigated biofuels. And we have energy policy in this country that pushes us toward more biofuels. So we might actually be trading off our dependence on foreign oil for a dependence on domestic water through an energy policy that pushes us toward biofuels, especially biofuels from irrigated feedstocks. Hydraulic fracturing is another element of water intersecting with the energy sector. These numbers are just water consumption, and this is an analysis for Texas. Different unconventional resources have very different water requirements for them, but if we look at conventional natural gas and natural gas from hydraulic fracturing, as you would imagine, there's more water associated with hydraulic fracturing operation per MMBTU, per unit of energy. But the interesting part of all of this is that additional natural gas, at least in Texas, displaces coal from the electricity grid. The marginal producer that gets displaced is coal. And even though we had to invest more water in hydraulic fracturing, we're saving water by displacing lignite coal from the electricity grid. This is interesting, but it doesn't capture the whole picture here. So this, these are average values over the course of a, a lifetime of a well. Hydraulic fracturing is a little bit different in that it requires a lot of water right here, right now, and it definitely changes the water quality of what comes out of the hole. So there are different approaches to mitigating some of the water requirements for energy. They have trade-offs associated with them. We could have a widespread move toward dry cooling. The advantage is that we no longer have the water requirements for electricity generation, but we also lose efficiency. So disadvantages are that these things take up lots of space and they are very expensive. Without the right price on water, there isn't a move toward dry cooling. We could capture carbon. Carbon capture and sequestration would reduce carbon emissions for sure. Capturing that carbon requires more water. By some estimates, it doubles the water requirements of the power plant itself, just capturing the carbon and sequestering it. It decreases the efficiency of the power plant, and it costs a lot of money. We could move toward renewables. The advantage is there that there's no water, there's no direct carbon emissions associated with those. They're not dispatchable, but we are developing ways to work around that. They're somewhat expensive, but not nearly as expensive as everything else, and the price parity of these are just keep going down with time. And conservation and efficiency are other forms of electricity and energy that really have to be considered in the entire mix. By using less, we have less water and less carbon. Sometimes these things cost money. Efficiency measures might cost money. It might just be a behavioral change. So this is a relatively low hanging fruit, so to speak. So on the other side of the energy water nexus, we use energy for water. Collecting and conveying water requires a lot of energy. Water is heavy. We know that when we lift a gallon of water, it is, it is heavy and moving lots of water around requires a lot of electricity. We add even more electricity to that water source by treating and distributing it from drinking water treatment plants. We pump it to your house, and if you're like me, you're gonna take a scalding hot shower. So you add even more energy into that water to heat it up. And then after it drains from the bottom of the shower, it goes to a wastewater treatment plant where we add even more energy to clean it up. So there's a lot of energy added in every single part of the water cycle. Sorry about that. 
This came up yesterday in the keynote uh, that the water sector really does use a lot of energy. And from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, their estimate is that letting your faucet run for five minutes uses about as much energy as letting a 60 watt light bulb run for 14 hours. This is especially interesting when we think about human behavior. Any of you that have children, you probably, like me, follow your kids around and turn the lights off because that's so wasteful. Turn the light off. My goodness, stop, stop leaving the lights on. We would not really think of letting a light bulb burn for 14 hours, that's so wasteful. But letting a faucet run for five minutes? If you have an old house like mine, you might have to let it run for five minutes just to get hot water out. There are differences in how we've been classically trained to think about resources and thinking about the interconnection between them. So different sources of water require different types of energy. Thus, this is mostly correlated with the water quality. The source water quality determines how much energy we need to put into it to clean it up. Typically, groundwater is cleaner than surface water, but we have to pump it from underground to the surface, so that's the additional energy input. As we look at saline water sources, brackish groundwater or seawater for desalination, there's lots and lots more energy that has to go into cleaning up those water sources. How we use water in our homes is something that is honestly poorly understood. These, this study is from 1999. That was a long time ago, friends. And how we use water in our homes is not really something that we keep good track of. At a national level, a lot of it goes outdoors. We're really good at growing crops of green lawns using drinking water to irrigate them. Indoors, we use a lot of water in our toilets and in our clothes washers. Maybe these need clean water, but maybe not drinkable water. This is something that we don't measure very well. And as Professor Glennon said last night, you can't manage what you don't measure. And measuring things is a place to start. So once all of that water has been used in a home and we send it to a wastewater treatment plant, how clean the effluent is, is determined, determines then how much energy we have to put into it. If you were paying attention to the drinking water numbers, they were lower than all of these wastewater numbers. The energy that we have to put in on the wastewater treatment side is higher than the energy that we have to put in to treat drinking water in the first place. We've as a society move toward activated sludge and removing nutrients from wastewater treatment plant effluent, and that requires more energy along the way. Another element of concern is our contaminants of emerging concern, these pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Our wastewater treatment plants really weren't designed to remove those emerging contaminants, and getting those out of our wastewater requires more energy to do so. Again, there are different approaches to managing this energy for water side of things. They have trade-offs. We could go toward desalination. The advantage is that it's a relatively drought-proof source of clean water. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of energy. We could increase the amount of water storage we have in the natural environment. We generally don't build large reservoirs like this anymore because we now understand the massive environmental impacts of big dams like this and the massive cost associated with them. We could reuse water. This is an especially interesting approach to things. It matches water quality with its intended use. It takes energy to pump water, and pumping water from a wastewater treatment plant to homes for irrigation is an additional energy investment. It costs money, but not nearly as much as desalination. And conservation and efficiency, again, are good measures. Less water equals less energy. Sometimes these cost additional money, but sometimes in the long run they save money. So I started off with multi-scale analyses, and I wanted to just end with a few interesting studies going on in my research group in this area of the intersection between water and energy, and things that we can do that support sustainability. So part of it is measuring things so that we can manage them. We've done an analysis in my group of water withdrawal and consumption for power generation in Illinois. As you heard, we historically have more than enough water, so we don't do as great of a job of measuring what's going on. 
We're also doing a risk assessment for aquatic species and their response to thermal pollution. So the temperature changes associated with cooling from thermoelectric power plants can have negative impacts on aquatic ecosystems. It actually matters what kind of species we're talking about, and one size doesn't actually fit all when it comes to policies. That was supposed to be a black background, so I understand that you can't read any of that. Uh, imagine, if you will, that the white is actually black, and we're looking at a, an image of temperature in a roof system of a green roof compared to a conventional roof. So we've estimated energy benefits from different roofing systems to take advantage of urban hydrology and hydraulics and to the energy benefits associated with them. And we're also modeling the feasibility of reusing treated effluent from wastewater treatment plants in a beneficial capacity, specifically power plant cooling. So I'm last, so I guess I get to ask for questions. If your question doesn't get answered by me and you want to follow up with me, this is how you can contact me. So at this point, I would like to uh, open up the floor for questions for um, any of um, or all of our uh, three speakers from this session. And please use the microphones um, in the, uh, on the aisles. So, um, Mark, uh, you know, you mentioned this uh, report with the nutrient loss reduction strategy uh, and, and it was sort of the roadshow and well, being well received. Um, Jim, you mentioned uh, the need to move away from uh, voluntary financial payment based approaches to more, um, you know, polluter pay approaches. What is your general sense of how well these uh, such approaches might be received? I mean, as you present this approach, to stakeholders, uh, it's great to have these alternatives and you know people may embrace them, but of course they're costly. So what is the reaction you get? And then from your work in Pennsylvania, what kind of reaction do you get when you talk about polluter pay approaches? Well, the, the one comment, I got a, a number of uh, presentations for farmer groups is, is an interesting one. It's how long do we have, they say, before we get regulated? It's sort of how long, how long do you think it's gonna be till we'll you know, if we don't do this, that we'll get. And so I think that kind of answers that. I, I, it's, I don't know. I don't know that the voluntary approach for a lot of these things is, is good to work. I think this is the opportunity. I think there is this interval, of, there's a number of years coming up here. Uh, I think what's different is the agricultural industry is not fighting, fighting this in the sense, mainly because it's voluntary, but at least they're not fighting, you know, 15 years ago, they were saying, well, we're not even the problem at all. So in one sense, we've come a long way. The other now is, will people really do some of these things? And I really don't know. I think some things, they, they may, some of the simpler things, but I don't think like bioreactors or wetlands are gonna cover our landscape anytime soon. They're just too expensive. And they, people are more interested in things that might potentially relate to yield. And so some of the in-field kinds of practices may get some acceptance. Can it be enough to actually see a difference under this voluntary framework? I, I don't know. I, I think that's, I, I think it's gonna be, be difficult. Uh, but the, the good side is right now, there's a lot of optimism. I think that the industry is really viewing, it. they've really taken this much further than I thought they would in terms of getting the word out. And they're sort of saying, look, we, we've got, if we don't do this, other th other, the stick is gonna come out. So in Pennsylvania, the problem is we can't pay enough money to get people to do things voluntarily. It's just not a, a feasible thing to do. So uh, if EPA is going to be serious about the Chesapeake Bay TMDL and all indications are that they are, and they actually have been writing Pennsylvania very nasty letters about how they're not making enough progress. Um, you have to do something differently, and if you don't have the resources from, for the pay the polluter approach, then you have to do something that's going to be mandatory um, and perhaps entail some other mechanism. Um, so I think, you know, uh, an interesting part is that um, uh, unlike here where the probably a lot more of the polluter, there's a lot more polluters than we have. I think the nature of our 
uh, problem allows us to target to a much greater extent. And so I think because of our capacity to target, we might be able to say, well, you know, we're going to target resources to particular places and we're going to let other people alone. And that may kind of change the political economy of the problem. But at this point in time, I, I do suggest mandatory practices and places, but I say it very quietly, um, uh, just for various reasons. Um, and we have had the, you know, uh, in Pennsylvania, the Farm Bureau has been fighting back. The National Farm Bureau has actually sued EPA on the TMDL they lost. So we're going to go ahead. I just want to add one thing. Uh, uh, one thing that is different. I mean, in, in a lot of places with manure and hilly areas, it is a small area it provides a disproportionate amount of the nutrients. But it is different here in the Midwest. And it's most fields for, for nitrate. And it's the, sort of the system, the corn, soybean, tile drain system, in most cases, loses a fair amount of nitrate. I mean, it's not, it's not the same across every field, but it is most fields. For phosphorus, it's, it's a little more, uh, you might be able to target a little more, but we generally don't talk about targeting because it isn't just a few fields. It isn't, it's most, most farms, for the most part, that are conventionally farmed. Uh, I guess a question for both uh, Mark and Jim here. Uh, great presentations all, thank you. Um, isn't sort of uh, the U.S. farm policy, the farm program, really the elephant in the room? And are we really ever going to get there unless we have some kind of, you know, epic overhaul uh, or at least recognition that that's really the driver? I, I agree. That's why I was trying to say, I mean, we've created and farmers are very good at in the Midwest of producing corn and soybeans because that's what they make the most money with. And as long as they're going to make the most money, particularly with corn, they may, and we saw that a few years ago when the price of corn was really high. It didn't really happen in Illinois, but on the western side of the corn belt, more and more acres went in the corn out of grasslands. Uh, there was the one story in Iowa where they tore up the, the golf course. I mean, that wasn't typical. But basically, everybody was growing as much corn as they could. And that's a result of the policies that we have. And so, yeah, I, I think fundamentally that is, we, farmers do what we pay them, we reward them for, and we're rewarding them for the most corn and soybean. The higher the yields, the better they do. We don't, we don't reward them for better nutrient balances. We don't reward them for having less nitrate go out the tile. We reward them for yield. And that's a hard thing to, to have a change when that's the, the only thing we're rewarding them for. Um, I don't have much to answer to that, but, or add to that. Um, but I do think it goes back to the theme of getting the prices right. So I think what we have is a lot of distortions that encourage environmentally harmful practices. Um, and we have them in a lot of different areas. Um, ethanol policies, for example. Um, the lack of a carbon tax, for example. Uh, the lack of water pricing. And I think once we recognize that a lot of the problems we want to solve today, talking, we're talking about today, yesterday, tomorrow, um, if we think about pricing the externalities or pricing the scarcity of water, then I think we'll, we will improve the system and hopefully have better outcomes with a lot less stress than is required than if we try to plan and solve every problem individually. Um, the, the yields of corn and soybean have risen about 30% since 1990, yet according to the Economic Research Service, applications of nitrogen have stayed pretty constant, about 130 kilograms per hectare. So given that the nitrogen content of the crops have not gone down and the yields have gone up, why aren't we seeing some benefit from this, particularly in the Mississippi? Well, there's two things. One, the, the um, nitrogen content of corn has gone down over the last uh, 25 or 30 years. The corn, no, protein has gone down. Protein in corn has gone down, and so the nitrogen harvested. Now, still, the amount overall, the, the yields have in, increased more than that. But no, for soybean, it stayed the same. But we are harvesting less corn per bushel, or less nitrogen per bushel than we were. But you're right, fertilizer has stayed steady for 30 years now, and yields have gone up dramatically. 
So uh, one of the things Greg McIsaac and I do a lot is look at nitrogen balances. And for the most part, they were getting better. And uh, the drought kind of threw that off because of 2012 because then, they, then you get a really positive balance because you put all the fertilizer on and the, the corn crop did very poorly. So the question is, are things getting better? And it, the part of it is, is a, as I said, a really sloppy system in terms of nitrogen, plus you have nitrogen coming from the soil as well, from the large organic matter pools that we have. So on one hand, it, it seems like it should be getting better, but, and there are some indications that some, that it has gotten a little better, but it, it's not much. Uh, so I think that just says, uh, you know, we've got soybeans in the system, we've got a lot of nitrogen moving around, and that, that increase in a, you know, f sort of efficiency of the amount of fertilizer compared to yield has, has, not, has not done it. Yeah, my, my question is for Ashley. Nice talk and effective talk. I'm wondering if uh, the story of the photovoltaic changes if you consider life cycle assessment, because there's a lot of water that goes in the manufacturing of those equipment. Uh, and so how does the life cycle uh, assessment uh, play into the uh, kind of things you present? Good question. The, the life cycle of water for photovoltaic panels is not zero. The difference is in the operations and over the lifetime of the panel they still come out better from a water perspective compared to other electricity generating technologies. So in, in the numbers that say zero, it's not zero over the course of the lifetime. But if we look at the lifetime of the steel associated with a nuclear plant and a coal plant and all of that, we still see that photovoltaics and wind turbines come out ahead in terms of water. They also don't require water during the operations, although some folks will say they get more efficiency if you wash them off. Generally, folks that own photovoltaic panels will just say wait for a rain, and that's good enough to improve the efficiency from dust deposition. Ashlyn, I have what I think is a two-part question, um, but the, the first piece is, can you just clarify the difference between withdrawal and consumption? I think I'm kind of missing Yes, that. yes, I can. I do this in class a lot, and this is a question on my midterm, so anyone in the room that is in my class, take notes. Withdrawal is removal from a water source, so it's very similar to a bank account where you would make a withdrawal. It would be withdrawal from an aquifer, from a lake, from a river. Consumption is that which is not returned. So it's usually, in the case of thermoelectric power, consumed via evaporation, but it could also be embedded in a product. It could be embedded in the biomass in the case of agriculture. If we were running a soda bottling company, there would be water associated with that actual soda. So that would be considered consumption. Mathematically speaking, the difference between withdrawal and return flow is consumption. Okay, so now that I've got that straight. Thank I, you. I, I will pass that portion of the exam. <laughs> Um, I, I want to make the argument that um, withdrawal and consumption for non-irrigated bioenergy crops is both zero. And the reason I want to make that argument, um, just so that you can say I'm wrong, is um, you have a bioenergy crop on the landscape, but you had a vegetated landscape to begin with and you'll have a vegetated landscape afterwards. So you have a vegetated landscape, so there's, in essence, you're balancing withdrawal with a pre-existing condition. Consumption, I would argue, is zero because that, that evapotranspiration becomes precipitation regionally. So um, how do you respond? So in the case of non-irrigated feedstocks, I would agree with you that in the actual cultivation of the biomass, there is no withdrawal. It would be withdrawal of rainwater and consumption would be evapotranspiration, which yes, does come down as rain elsewhere, but it might come down as rain in Pennsylvania, and we don't really care about that in Illinois. <laughs> Sorry. We have plenty. They got plenty of water over there, apparently. So the, the challenge of consumption is location specific. It matters what happens upstream because folks downstream depend on that return flow. And if all of a sudden we are 
consuming more water through an irrigated biomass or non-irrigated biomass or a power plant that changes the downstream flow and maybe we need to flush and flush often because everyone downstream needs that water. I have a question for both Jim and, and Mark. I saw in your presentations uh, there's some kind of a target, for example, the Gulf of Kapoxia. There was a target set in the 80s or 90s. And then the, the actuality was that uh, uh, it was more like three times that the tar target was not met, not even close. So, and, and I've been in this uh, Illinois for 10 years and involved in many proposals. Uh, and we would say that we will, if you do this research, if you do this, we will reduce the Gulf of hypoxia problem. This is kind of standard thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed that we have a target and we have been waiting for 35 years for that, for that, for the meet to meet the target and we have not met the target. So is there a possibility that the reason that we are not making, meeting the target is that the, the, the people who produce the pollution are here in Illinois. The consequences in, in, Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico over there and there's not, not a connection made. In other words, the people who are suffering uh, are not having an impact on what, what uh, uh, made a, made, uh, there's no connection made between the Gulf over there, people who are in the fisheries and so on. Is that the reason that they are, we are not making the target? That, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really surprised that we have this target and we have been waiting for 35 years and we're not even close. So uh, there must be another way to look at this problem. So in, in the Pennsylvania, in the, excuse me, Chesapeake Bay case, the target was set for all of the Bay states. Now, Pennsylvania is upstream of the Bay. We don't, we don't have any of the Bay. New York doesn't have much of the Bay, has none of the Bay. West Virginia has none of the Bay. Um, so uh, according to what you're suggesting, maybe we didn't make progress because we didn't have a part of the Bay. And that's actually true. It's their problem. Um, uh, but the states that surround the Bay and have water on the Bay also didn't make progress. So I think the reason we, um, we did a lot in the Chesapeake Bay region to address point source pollution because the, we had the regulatory mechanisms through the Clean Water Act to do so. The lack of progress happens with the non-point sources and particularly with the agricultural source, sources. And I don't think it's um, a matter of who's on the bay and who's not on the bay. I think it's a matter that agriculture has been very effective in uh, avoiding having to address the problems that it creates for a variety of reasons. Um, and now I think we see a lot of pressure to be on ag to actually finally sort of step up. I think it's a little different for the Mississippi. I, we've done surveys. You're, you're, you're exactly right, Siva. I, people, farmers in Illinois are less concerned with downstream, especially further downstream effects. But on the other hand, I think there, there's two things. One, Louisiana, for the most part, has not made a big deal of the hypoxic zone. And you don't really hear, you don't hear the governor or other people sort of talking about the Midwest and you guys got to do something. They, I don't know that they perceive it as their big, as, as a really big problem. And, and some of you may disagree with that, but I think if they did, that would get more attention. So that, I think that's one thing. The second is, we have a lot of water quality problems, though, within Illinois. Every reservoir, we, have a, we actually have, have, had, have and have had had a standard for reservoirs for phosphorus for, uh, since the 70s. Every reservoir doesn't meet it. So they're all in violation. We have all these TMDLs. None of them are effective. So even the local problems, and then we have local problems with nitrate in drinking water. Danville and, and Decatur around here violate the drinking water standard. What do they do? They build ion exchange plants. So we've kind of learned to live with it. It's, it's not getting worse. It's, it is what it is, and we sort of live with it, essentially. So uh, for the sake of time, we have uh, only time for one Just more question. Very quick question. So it is for Mark, actually. Mark, you mentioned very nicely and very ex nicely explained that uh, biofuels are quite beneficial to control the nutrients. But there are two issues with the biofuel, and water quality and quantity. You just talk about the quality, but can you give some comments about the quantity? The second question, when you said about 90%, so 90% control is because of the control of the 
nutrients or because if you suppose you apply the same amount of nutrients as you are using for the row crops, what will be the impact on, uh, on actually the water quality? The third one, can you generalize this 90% for the whole US or you have some comments on that? Well, I think in general, perennials and biofuels are really efficient. Whether you, you don't need to fertilize them at a rate anywhere near a regular crop because they don't use, they're so efficient at recycling the nutrients and their harvested material has so little of nutrients in them like nitrogen or phosphorus. If we fertilize them at the same rate as corn, they wouldn't, they'd still be really effective. They probably wouldn't be 99% or 90%, but they'd still be really effective because it's a perennial root system out there. But we're never gonna need to do that because they're, they're productive uh, and the harvest is, is, is what it is. In terms of water use though, uh, yeah, some of the biofuel crops can use more water, but you know, we're so far from that. You, know, you can do the simulations and if you put yeah, miscanthus all over a watershed, you might dry up the stream in, in the fall. I'm not, I'm not all that worried about that. When we get any, tell me about it when we get even 5% of the watershed in, in, a, in a biofuel. So I, I don't think, I think there are issues with water use, but I, I just don't see biofuels displacing on, on the really productive lands uh, any of the, the major uh, grains. I think they, where they have better is on the more marginal lands, and there you get a lot of benefits because they probably shouldn't have been in row crop anyway. So with that, I would like to uh, ask you to thank our speakers once again.